Well, good morning. Today is a very, very special day. Uh, I, you, you're going you're gonna to be like, I can't believe I'm here to see this. Go ahead and pinch yourself. Can you do that? Pinch yourself. Pinch yourself. And then I want you to lean over to the person next to you, especially if they're a visitor. You don't want to pinch them too. Give them a pinch. It's a special day. You're not dreaming. This is the day when the pastor of disaster brings out the shorts. From Memorial Day to Labor Day, I wear shorts. So, you know, if you have it, you flaunt it. That's, that's, that's what it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So, well, a uh, big shout out to those of you who are brand new today. We want to shout out to uh, our family that's watching online. Lindsay, James, Nancy, Charbeth, Jeanette, and Julie. Those are the ones I was able to uh, see you there very quickly before I came out. Um, Today's a special day because if you struggle in any way, shape, or form with low confidence, today's going to help you, okay? Because what I'm going to help you achieve is not confidence, but Kanye fidence, okay? Someone took Kanye West quotes and put them in a generator, and it just keeps shooting them out, and it helps you with your self-esteem. I love Kanye. I have always loved Kanye. Kanye is someone that just needs a friend to say, quit the corny stuff, right? Uh, But I love him. I think he's incredibly talented. But someone took all of his crazy quotes and put them into the Kanye Fidence generator. Uh, And here are some of my favorites. First, when I think of competition, it's like I try to create against the past. I think about Michelangelo and Picasso, you know, the pyramids. For me to say I wasn't a genius, I would be just lying to you and to myself. (laughs) Everything I'm not made me everything I am. In my humble opinion, that's a prophetic statement. That's something Gandhi would have said. I love this. I'm Warhol. I'm the number one most impactful artist of our generation. I am Shakespeare in the flesh, Walt Disney, Nike, (laughs) Google. I love this one. Come on now. How could you be me and want to be someone else? Remember that. That, That's a good comeback in marriage, right? Um, Here we go. Caught 10,000 retweets in half a second. Hashtag facts. This is not the album of the year. This is album of the life. And this this is terrible. It's so funny. My greatest pain in life is that I'll never be able to see myself perform live. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine an actual musical genius like like Michael Jackson or Louis Armstrong talking about themselves, right? Like, they just would not ever talk about themselves. Here's more. Here's one more. And when someone comes up and says something like, I'm a god. Everybody says, who does he think he is? I just told you who I think I was, a God. I just told you that's who I think I am. Psychologists have a name for people who talk this way. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, it's called the DSM, DSM DSM-5, Um, is a guide for psychologists and psychiatrists to label people so you can say, oh, this person needs to be in so many different sessions and stuff. And they say, according to the DSM, that anyone who suffers from a fixed false belief that he or she possesses superior qualities, such as genius, power, influence, fame, omnipotence, or wealth, have what is called a delusional disorder. Now, do you know anybody like this? The delusional disorder is a belief that is held with strong conviction despite evidence disproving it, right? Someone that has a delusional disorder usually has different, like, schizophrenia schizophrenia and stuff like that. But more often than that, they're everyday people that we know. They will say, with someone with a delusional disorder, will say, everything's going to be great, it's going to be huge, It's going to be the best we've ever seen. Do you know anybody that talks like that? You have any friends that talk like that? They're more important, more special, more privy, more insightful than everybody else in the world. And listen, whenever we encounter someone like that, we know that they're not well. 
In the late 1950s, there was a psychiatrist named um, Milton Rokiak, and he thought that what he would take is he would take three people who had a delusional disorder that thought they're Jesus and put them in a support group for Jesus. This is a Jesus support group. So what he did is this is the Ypsilanti State Hospital. It looks really creepy, by the way. And so he brought them over to a support group and his findings, he just wanted to know, what are they going to say to each other? Three people that believe in Jesus, when they meet someone else that's Jesus, what are they going to do? Well, he put his findings into a book called The Three Christs of Ypsilanti. It was also turned into a movie of some pretty good actors. And he put them in a discussion group. And at first he said, it didn't go well. This Jesus support group did not go well. You ought to worship me, I tell you, one of the Christ yelled. I will not worship you. You're a creature. You better live your own life and wake up to the facts. No two men are Jesus Christ. I am the good Lord, one said. After they got used to each other and comfortable, they would come in, they have cups of coffee, and the conversations, he said, were comical. One would claim, I am the Messiah, the Son of God, I was sent here to save the earth. And Rokiak would say, how do you know? And he said, God told me. And the other patient would say, I never told you such a thing. And yeah, we, we laugh at someone that talks like that, but, you know, uh, they're delusional, right? Like, who do you know that talks like that? I know someone that talks like that. John chapter 10, verse 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple walking in Solomon's colum colonnade. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, the Jews were there. They were gathered there around him. And they were saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, for those of you who are new to Christianity, new to church, up until the time of Jesus, uh, the Roman Empire had taken over. And they were looking for someone like some of their great leaders from the past, Moses, David, Nehemiah, Judas Maccabee, to sort of rise up and help beat the, um, the foreign foes. What I want you to think of is I want you to picture a, um, an MMA fighter who was a politician. Like, imagine if Conor McGregor was president, right? We would probably get in a few wars. That's the kind of person they're looking for. Someone who can go and kick some butt and, and take names later. And so, they were looking for someone not to replace God. That would be crazy. They were looking for, in Hebrew, it's called... Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Joshua, it's, which means he saves people from their sins. Yeshua HaMashiach, Mashiach is the Messiah. So Joshua the Messiah is going to do that. Jesus answered, I did tell you I was the Messiah, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name test about me, but you don't believe because you're not my sheep. And so in other words, I did all these miracles. So John, the person that baptized, and I want you to hang with me. There's going to be payoff in this. John, Jesus' cousin that was later thrown in prison, right before he died, he sent some of his followers to go ask Jesus, seriously, are you the guy we're looking for or not? And then Jesus answered back to John. Go back and report to John what you see and what you hear. The blind receive the sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. These are my miraculous signs. I don't believe what I say. Watch what I do. Okay. Now, I love what the Gospel of John says about Jesus. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we looked with our hands and have touched, this is who we're proclaiming. So, the Jewish leader's like, stop it with the nonsense. Just tell us who you are. And Jesus said, I did tell you, but you don't believe the works I do in my Father's name testify about me. You don't believe me because you're not my sheep. Have you ever been around sheep? I'm wanting to get sheep soon. I, I, it's going to take me time to build a fence and, and all of that because I want to do it myself. And I have no discernible skills in building anything. So this is going to take a while. So I, 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 sheep, people think sheep are stupid. Sheep are just animals that don't have the natural defenses of horns. We're sheep, Jesus says. And so what sheep do is that they run and they mob up. 
And so that way, that, that way they protect themselves. You ever seen these uh, reels where a jogger is running down through the forest and a whole flock of sheep will start following that person? It's because they are almost utterly dependent upon a shepherd for their annual or biannual shearing, their hooves, their food, all of that kind of stuff. Now, where have you heard that people are like sheep and we need a shepherd? Where have you heard that? Funerals, right? Psalm 23. Keep that in your mind for a second. What he says next sounds like something that she should have been the fourth member in the Ypsilanti support group. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than them all. No one can snatch the sheep out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. I want you to look at this. Right here. I and the father are one. How many of you have friends, don't raise your hand, that are skeptics of Christianity? And they're looking for any argument that will basically refute what you believe. One of the things that people teach is that the idea of Jesus being God was something that was not made here in the first century, not even in the second century, not in the third century, not even in the fourth century. They got to this point sort of in the fourth and the fifth century because Pastors came together in the 4th century. They had a council, a meeting of pastors called Nice in a town in Turkey called Nicaea, and they wrote what is called the Nicaean Creed. We believe what? Right? And you go on and on and on. Some of you have recited these. Some of you have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicaean Creed. Those came out of different councils. Councils. What skeptics will tell you is that your belief that you follow Jesus and he has the power to do things in your life comes from the fact that you believe that he's God. This is something that was made up in the fourth century. Third century, second century, first century. Read this back together, everybody. I and the Father are in Greek. Homoousios. Lean over the person next to you and say, I love you, homo Lucius. We are of the same essence. We're the same thing. If someone took a bandsaw, you'd have a very bad, painful day. But if they cut you literally in half and you were still able to talk and you looked at the other half of you, you'd be like, what's up, man? And uh, that's you, right? That's you. What the Bible is saying in the first century by the first disciple that Jesus was called, right? James and John, right? Homo Lucius, I and the Father are one. The deity of Jesus, the belief that Jesus, the Father and Jesus are the exact same thing did not happen here in the fourth century. It happened, it came out of Jesus' mouth, okay? Very important that you hold on to that. His Jewish opponents pick up stones to stone him. If we were trying to kill someone very quickly in our day, what would we do? Like if you had to kill someone, probably pull out a gun, a knife, hit him with a car. First century, if someone said something nuts about God, they took you out and they picked up a bunch of rocks and every person in the community, all of you, had to throw stones at the person. Leviticus 24, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is put to death. The entire assembly must stone him. Jesus looks at them and says, many works I have done from the Father. Which of these are you going to stone me for? And then what did they say? Was the idea that Jesus is God, the deity of Jesus, something that came from the fourth century? Read this out loud. Next one. Together. We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Today we're beginning a new series called Courage Under Fire. And um, there is, let me ask you this question, what is the fastest growing religious group in the United States right now? It's called the nuns. 
Not like nuns from a monastery. That'd be kind of cool, though. Can you imagine? That would seem sort of like, what was that show where people dressed like nuns? It was on Hulu. Did you see? Anyway. The nuns are people who, who claim no religious affiliation. They really don't believe in anything. What is happening in our culture, in a, in a place like where we live, where Christianity was assumed, the veracity, the truthfulness of our claims were assumed that we weren't really made fun of. Now, it's almost to the point where you bite your tongue before you say at a dinner with a bunch of friends that you're a Christian. Two reasons. Number one, they lump you in with all of the kooky Christians out there, right? And number two, they think you believe bizarre claims that have no historical background to them. And so we live in a culture where our faith is under fire right now. Now, this isn't a victim mentality. This isn't something that we're made up, that's made up. For you to say that you're a Christian, not in an obnoxious way, but to actively be able to have conversations with them about your Christian faith, there are significantly more people that will doubt you and push you down. Your husband right now may be pushing you down, or your wife may be pushing you down regarding your faith. Your friend may be pushing you down. The people at work may be pushing you down. You're like, I'm just going to back, I'm going to stay in this little corner, I'm not going to say anything, because the moment I do, this person that has listened to 17,000 talk shows and knows all the finer points of rhetoric and debate is just going to come after me. What we're going to do here in this series is we're going to talk about fighting back. And so, as a church, we've bought everybody guns. And I'm just kidding. We're going to learn to fight back with what? Our words. The Apostle Peter, who denied Jesus at one point and came back to believe him, said, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. They may be jerks to you. You respond in kindness. As Marcus Aurelius used to say, the greatest form of revenge is not to be like that. So, one of the biggest concerns as we talk about our faith and believing and not being pushed down is, is us. We're one of the biggest problems because if you haven't noticed here in the last six months, there is an underlying theme to everything that we've been talking about. And that underlying theme is this, that when Jesus comes and lives inside of us, there is a supernatural existence that we're to begin living. The Bible talks about walking in the spirit, James talks about, and not gratifying the flesh. That when people who are walking in the spirit, who are living in the supernatural, begin to operate that way, God starts doing some really unthought of bizarre things. You know how everybody's super creeped out by AI, artificial intelligence? Like, at some day we're going to build a machine and it's basically going to kill us all. I can't, I can't determine whether that's true or not, but I will tell you this. The more artificial, or the more artificial intelligence becomes a dominant factor in all of our lives the more you are going to be able to distinguish Christians who are walking in the spirit versus who are those who are walking in this flesh. Because all artificial intelligence is doing is giving you the sum total of human thought. And eventually what's going to happen is people are going to start hungering for a word from God. That this is the best we can do Really, this is like, this is the best you've got. Um, I was hired uh, a number of years ago as a small group pastor in a church in the south, in Clearwater, Florida. Loved the people, loved the church. Uh, we moved to Clearwater, Florida, loved it. Every Friday night, we went to the beach, and someone had to suffer for Jesus, and it might as well be us. So 
we went to the beach. Um, our daughter would go out and run in the sand. It was just so much fun. It was a great place. Um, but they hired me to, to start small groups there. And for some reason, somehow I've gained the reputation that I don't like small groups. That's absolutely not true. I've been in so many different small groups in 35 years of being a Christian. I love small groups. What I don't like is I don't like ineffective small groups. I don't like groups where someone can be in a group for two years, they don't pray anymore, serve anymore, give anymore, lead anymore, evangelize anymore, and understand the Bible anymore than when they started two years ago. That the whole point of a group is for one person and a collection of people to transfer their obedience to Jesus. What often happens in Christian small groups, and we fight against that here at this church, is the group, all it will do is pull together the collective disobedience of the people. or to become like Jesus. So we want to be in a group where we begin to learn how to walk in the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Anyway, I showed up at this church. They said, you want a small group? And I said, I said if you want me to start small groups, you're going to have to allow me to start groups that actually work. And I'm going to start with the easiest possible one but it's going to make you uncomfortable. I'm telling him, then I walk up to the stage and I make an announcement. This is a prim and proper Southern church. Everybody's in suit and ties. Everybody's in dresses. I actually liked it because all you had to do was get one suit and just keep wearing the same suit over and over and change the ties every week. Uh, Lisa says I do the same thing with my khaki shorts and my black shirts, but I stand up and I say, uh, hi, my name is Brian. Um, I'm going to help lead the effort for groups with you together here. We're going to start a new group for survivors of sexual abuse. And it's going to start in a month. And we have a Christian therapist that's going to lead it. And if you would like to be a part of that, just know after the services, before and after, um, I'm going to, you, I, you come up and tell me you want to be in it. I'll keep it private. And I've told you this a million times, and I'm going to keep telling you this. I, I lost count after a week of the number of people that came up to me and said, what I'm about to tell you, I've never told another soul. It was so incredibly heartbreaking. All of these people that had been used by other people to gratify, like it's the worst possible example of gratifying themselves off of someone that was too innocent to be able to fight back. And the beauty of what happened in that group is that Jesus showed up and started changing lives. But the reason it happened is because people in the group from day one were honest with one another. See, I think one of the biggest reasons that Christians, at least, don't believe in Jesus, that he'll actually do anything, is because some Christians haven't become disciples yet. Dallas Willard writes, the greatest issue facing the world today with all of its heartbreaking needs is whether those who by profession and culture are identified as Christians will become disciples. And so the thing that I want you to keep in mind is this. Jesus can't heal what Jesus can't touch. If you are not going to bring it out in the open, Jesus can't do anything with it. It stays in the darkness in your mind, and it makes it worse. Um, for those of you who are here, we did a series. Gosh, it was like March. It was called 28 Days to Breakthrough. And we asked people to pray for something for a family member, Pray for something for a friend. Pray for something for themselves. I lost count of the number of people that came up to me and said it was the most bizarre thing. The thing that I prayed for the other person got answered. The thing that I prayed for the family member got answered. But the thing that I prayed for myself didn't happen. And I was like, do you see the theme there? All of these people were praying for something for themselves and it didn't happen, but when they prayed for someone else, it happened. It's because we're meant to live in Christian community with one another. And so if someone, if you got on someone else's list and they prayed for you, it probably would have happened, but not when you're praying for yourself. 
Can I give you some Hebrew for a second? Okay? Lean to the person next to you and say, wake up. He's bringing the Hebrew. He's bringing the fire. Wake up. Shake him right now. Grab him right now. Shake him right now and say, the Hebrew is coming. I think I didn't. Yeah, there we go. Okay, all right. The band sang a song. It was amazing. It was called Jehovah Jireh. It's a, if you get this, it's the foundation of where we're going with this series, okay? The name of God in Hebrew is that. And so in Hebrew, you always read from right to left. And they're all consonants. And essentially, it's this. Y-H, well... Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce that? Have absolutely no idea. No clue. Um, this is the name for God. And it's, what it is, is it's literally, I will create what I will create. And this word for create, it could be, I will be what I will be, I will touch what I touch, I will create what I create. But does everybody get that? Some of you grew up in homes. How many of you grew up in homes where you couldn't take the Lord's name in vain? Man, I'm telling you, it was over. You take the Lord's name in vain, you're going nowhere for the summer. It's over. The problem is, is this God's name? No. No. Is this God's name? No. What is God's name? That's God's name. And taking it in vain means I hit my foot. I go, Yahweh. Right? That's what it means. We don't need to punish. It's for decorum, maybe. We, are, we ought not be saying, oh, God, or oh, Lord. But that is not taking the Lord's name in vain. This is the Lord's name. Why is this important? Because critics say your deity, that we don't believe is actually a deity, it was created in the fourth century, which we showed it wasn't. It was from the first century. It came out of the lips of Jesus. But your deity that you created doesn't do anything. And we will say, for you maybe, because you're not one of the sheep. You're not one of his disciples. And maybe for you, you're a Christian, but you're have one foot in, in, one foot out, and you're not really committed and that sort of thing. But the people who learn to walk in the Spirit, God begins to do some crazy things. The song was Jehovah what? Jireh. Jaira is a Hebrew word, I won't go through all of that, which means a provider, a provider. What do we mean by that? So what I want you to get, hang with me, just get this. This is Jesus, and this is us here. This is the Old Testament before Jesus. They called him, they called God this, but in the Old Testament, there were instances where there was a name that was added, Yahweh or Jehovah Jireh. And what I mean by that is, it means the eternal, all-existing God will create what he creates to meet, and Jireh is Hebrew, for provision. And so when we're talking to skeptics, we're like, I can't come at you with intellectual arguments because you're not going to be intellectualized your way into the kingdom. But what I will do is what Jesus did. I will show you. I will show you. We will begin praying because we follow a God that will provide a life partner for you. Some of you are worried that God is not going to provide a life partner for you. And what you need to understand is that Yahweh or Jehovah is what? Jehovah Jireh. Some of you are thinking that check is not going to come in time. That job is not going to come in time. That kid is not going to change their behavior in time. 
You are not going to be able to change in time. Your spouse isn't going to be able to change in time. And what we have to understand is because Jesus is the same person as the Old Testament, when we follow him, we follow Jehovah Jireh. We also follow in the Old Testament, God the warrior, Yahweh Gabor or Jehovah Gabor. You're scared of something at work. There's someone that has you over a barrel. There's someone that's going to hurt you, someone that's going to hurt your reputation, someone that's going to hurt your family. We pray to Yahweh Gabor, the Almighty God, the one that turned over the greatest army in the world with Pharaoh, is probably going to be able to handle your boss. And so as we get into the series, we're going to talk about both understanding more the faith that's being attacked, but living out the faith that we're supposed to live. And I, I just, I truly believe some of these ideas are, are going to be transformational in the way that you begin to operate and the way you begin to walk. It's going to be the difference. It's going to be night and day between just simply walking and walking in the spirit. And so God, we thank you so much for our church family. We thank you so much as our leader, you never steer us wrong. As our leader, you have provided the way to come back to you. As our leader, we look to you and we pray that your spirit fills us. God, we live in a culture where we're being pushed down. We're being silenced. We're being ridiculed. We're being made fun of. You know that very well as our leader. People tried to silence you. People tried to ostracize you. People tried to off you. And then you popped right back up. And we know that even martyrdom cannot stop the good news of Jesus. We believe that your power lives in us by your spirit. We believe that you have created us for a purpose, that every single person here was created for a purpose, that you've created us to live out what the kingdom of God looks like in our lives, in our homes, at the work, wherever we live. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be Yahweh Yireh, Jehovah Jireh. We pray that you would be the provider that we look for. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.